Daniel chapter 22. Brother Barron, I've been here three and a half years, and in that three and a half years, I don't think I've heard you make one mistake. However, this morning, I don't think that Mrs. Dale will be preaching tomorrow night. Uh, at least she'll be speaking about the Darrell said. Now, Brother Darrell has said she does a good job preaching at home. And uh, so I think she probably does. Uh, lady came to D.L. Moody one time and she said that, Mr. Moody, I believe God's called me to preach. He said, really? And he said, how many children do you have? She said, I have 12. He said, there you are. Go home and preach to your children. And uh, so I think that's what Mrs. Dale does. So, well, uh, anyway. Uh, tonight, I do trust that you will be here and enjoy uh, hearing our brother Howard Lynn speak. Veteran, missionary, I think about 28 years in the Philippines, and a uh, good friend of our church, and we really appreciate it. And uh, we want to say thanks to him uh, for a job well done. And then Wednesday evening, our prayer meeting, and then the next Sunday morning, the Lord allows us to be here. I'm going to begin a series of messages on heaven. What will we wear in heaven? Will we be still, still be male and female in heaven? Will we still retain our identity? Will there be black, white, yellow in heaven? Uh, will we be able to recognize, well, that, that individual must have been from Japan. That individual must have been from China. Will we see that in heaven? What will we do in heaven? There are a lot of questions about heaven. And we'll not be able to answer everything because the Bible doesn't give every answer. But there are certainly a lot of answers the Bible gives concerning the matter of heaven. And uh, sometimes our vision of heaven is a little bit cloudy. We still have the idea we'll just float on a harp all day or it's going to be an eternal church service. And uh, there's uh, some things the Bible reveals about heaven that I think uh, will encourage our heart. And then we'll get back in the book of Revelation at chapter 11. We'll look at God's two witnesses there. And I trust that you'll be much in prayer for the, the days ahead. Now in 1 Samuel 22, we'll read verses 1 through 4. <clears throat> I want to speak to you this morning on the subject, Climbing Out of a Cave. Climbing Out of a Cave. 1 Samuel 22, verse 1. David therefore departed thence and escaped to the cave of Adullam. And when his brethren and all his father's house heard it, they went down thither to him. And everyone that was in distress, and everyone that was in debt, and everyone that was discontented gathered themselves unto him. And he became a captain over them. And there were with him about 400 men. And David went said uh, thence to Mishpah, uh, Moab, and he said unto the king of Moab, Let my father and my mother, I pray thee, come forth and be with you till I know what God will do for me. And he brought them before the king of Moab, and they dwelt with him all the while that David was in the hope. You're in the mountains. You're taking care of your father's sheep. You don't come home very often. When you do, you're reminded that you're the lowest of the low. And then all of a sudden, one day you're brought from watching the sheep, and you're brought home and you are anointed king of Israel. Then you come into Saul's presence, and you discover that there's a battle, and you step forward, and God gives you the victory over a giant. And then uh, you continue fighting for your country and for your king. And uh, pretty soon God gives you tremendous victories. The women begin to sing, Saul has slain his thousands, but David has slain his tens of thousands. And you're on the mountaintop. And the future is bright because one day you will be the king of all of the land. You will carry the scepter. You will wear the crown. You will set on the throne. That's what's ahead of you. And then all of a sudden, through some changes in circumstances, and because of a change in the king's attitude and spirit, you find yourself running and hiding. And now you find yourself in a cave. And David and his men, about 400 of them are there. 
And they find themselves in the cave of Adullam, which really means a hiding place. This pictures to me the ups and downs of the Christian life. This pictures to me how you can be on top one moment and you can be on the bottom the next. This pictures to me how you can have the accolades of the people at one time and you can be running the next. This pictures to me the fact that we need to be constantly on our toes, constantly alert to what's going on around us, and constantly alert to the fact that we have an enemy and that that enemy is constantly after us, constantly dogging our heels. If you turn to Psalm 57, you'll discover the thought in David's heart and the thought on David's mind while he was in this cave and while he was running from Saul. And in Psalm 57, David is revealing his heart and how he felt when he wanted to run and when he wanted to hide. Have you ever wanted to run away from it all? Have you ever wanted to hide? Have you ever wanted to just find yourself a place and get away? Moses wanted to get away to the desert. And Jonah found a juniper tree to sit down under and to pack. Peter said, when it looked like all was lost, I'm going fishing. And he found a fishing boat. David found a cave. Now what do I do and what do you do when life turns south? What do you do and what do I do when we have hit bottom? And there will be times in our lives as believers that those days will come and it will feel like that we are right on the bottom. How do you feel? How do you respond? What do you say? Are there nights of very little sleep? Uh, is there very little joy? Is there very little laughter? Is there very little strength in your life? Well, here is where David found himself. Now, thank God he did not remain there. Even the greatest of God's servants will find themselves sometimes at the bottom. And sometime in life, you will find yourself at the bottom of life. And it is my encouragement to you this morning to find out what David did and continue on serving God. If you look at Psalm 57 verse 1, you will notice that David gave himself over to prayer. Be merciful unto me, O God, be merciful unto me, for my soul trusteth in thee. Yea, in the shadow of thy wings I will make my refuge until these calamities be overpassed. Have you noticed in the Bible how many times you find the phrase, and it came to pass, and it came to pass, and it came to pass. Day turns into night. Night turns into day. Monday into Tuesday. Tuesday into Wednesday. Week in and week out. Month in and month out. Year in and year out. And the things that seem like an enormous battle and burden to us today, next year may not be remembered at all. At this time last year, this very moment, I was recovering from surgery. I was at home. Not in church, not in the pulpit. Those were dark, difficult days for me, but that's a year ago. That's gone. And when those days come and when you hit the bottom, it's important that we do not forget that we're to be men and women of prayer. God can do more for you than the world can do more can do for you. God can do more for you than your friends can do for you. God can do more for you than anyone can do for you. And you may seem like you're absolutely alone, but there is God there who will... Be there for you. Dr. Lee Robertson was 91, 92 years of age when he came to our church in South Carolina to preach for us. 91, 92 years of age, preaching over 50 years. And I remember coming in, him coming in our service that first night. I led him to our church so he could find his way there. He preached a tremendous message. Our people enjoyed it. Over 90 years of age. A man that founded Tennessee Temple University. A man that founded Camp Joy. A man that led Highland Park Baptist Church from 500 people to 15,000 people. And after the service was over and everyone was just about gone, Mrs. Robertson and uh, Dr. Robertson and myself and maybe just a couple of uh, associates were standing around 
And Dr. Robertson and Mrs. Robertson began to talk about uh, the work at Tennessee Temple and so forth. And I could note just a little bit of a discouragement as to what had happened and some of the things that he was disagreeing with about the future of the school and what was going on. And I thought to myself, here's a man 92 years of age. And then in the course of our conversation during his time there, uh, he made the statement to me, it seems like the older I get, the more difficult it becomes. And you would think that the older you get, the more you would know, the more you would understand. But my friends, this is life. And whether you're just someone ordinary in life like you and I, or someone that had attained great victories, there's always those times that we may feel like we're on the bottom, and we might feel discouraged. But here is David in prayer, uh, and looking for God for mercy, wanting to trust in God, finding his confidence in God, and wanting his faith uh, to be built in God. So he's in prayer to God. But then notice his perception in verse 2 and verse 3. I will cry unto God most high. Now Saul is daunting his steps, uh, continually after him. I think he's made some bad decisions and where he has traveled. I think he's made some bad decisions in who he's chosen as his friends. Uh, but yet he's trying to dig himself out of this place and dig himself out of this hole and raise up from the bottom. And he says, I will cry unto God most high, unto God that performeth all things for me. Did you notice that? For me. Now God is for this crowd this morning. Did you know that? He's for this choir and He is for you. But you know what David is saying? Uh, God may be for others, but He's for me. He is for me. By the way, uh, I was saved in 1950. Six, he has been for me all of those years. He's never been against me. And he'll never be against you. He's for you. Isn't that a great thought? David said that even though all these things are going on, and I don't understand, and there's some great battles, he is for me. All the sickness that's going on. And I think that we can say this morning that God is for Telecom. And I hate to mention names, but I mention them because these are people that are dear to us and these are things that, that we're seeing and that we're handling here in our church. God is for us. Then look at verse 3. He will send from heaven. Boy, I like that. This old world gets cloudy and dark and dreary and things happen to us and yet God is able to be for us and He says He will send things from heaven and save me from the reproach of Him that would swallow me up See, but think of that. Pause. Think of that. God will send forth His mercy and His truth. What a great God we have. What a great Savior that we have. That even though we may feel like we're on the bottom, and maybe sometimes the reason we're on the bottom, it is of our own making and our own choosing because of decisions that we make. Uh, whatever may come our way, and I'm sure that David is here because of some of the decisions that he's making, but he has enough perception to understand that he has a position before God who is the Most High, and that he has the power of God at his disposal, and all things that pertain to God are at his disposal here. And I trust this morning that you'll not falter and fail and realize that God is on the throne and will never fail you and will lead you all of the way through. In verse 3 again, I see David recognize that there is a plan for him. He will send from heaven and save me from the reproach of him that would swallow me up. Uh, you look at the world that we're in today, strange things are happening. Countries that uh, we used to deem third world countries are not third world countries anymore. They're now making the headlines in economy and in finance, and in war. And yet the Bible predicted this hundreds of years ago. That there would be a country coming down from the north. There would be a country coming up from the east. And there was a time that we looked at these countries as countries that would never be able to pull together this kind of army. And now we're seeing some of this shaking uh, around us and we're hearing it and the gas prices and all the things that are happening we're wondering about the economy and what's going to happen in the future well there's still a heaven and there's still a God and even though in the midst of all the terrible things he's able to send from heaven 
the brightness of heaven and the glory of heaven and to do something for you and me. God has a plan for us and He has a plan for me. That's what David said. And then he talked about the matter of provision. God will take care of me. And then he talked about there is a purpose. Now look at verse 4. My soul is among lions. I lie even among them that are set on fire. Even the sons of men whose teeth are spears and arrows and their tongue a sharp sword. Uh, that's true, isn't it? And that comes to us. That comes to all of us in life. Verse 6, They have prepared a net for my steps. My soul is bowed down. They have digged a pit before me into the midst whereof they have fallen themselves. Selah. But watch. My heart is fixed. Don't you like that? My heart is fixed. Oh God, my heart is fixed. I will sing and give praises. What would you do? What would I do if we felt like this? I think I mentioned last Sunday uh, how David mentioned the fact that wild beasts, men who were against him were just like wild beasts coming for him. But yet he said, my heart is fixed. Now, I want you to notice three things. Go back, if you will, uh, to our text in 1 Samuel chapter 22 and the thought of climbing out of the cave. Let me give you three thoughts concerning this matter. Number one, I want you to notice the realities of the cave. Uh, you may not have a cave. I might have a cave. But I'll guarantee you when you and I get distressed and perplexed and full of sorrow and when we don't have the answers, I'll guarantee you there's some place that we revert to. Some place that we go to to try to get some answers. Maybe we go and we pity ourselves. Maybe we go and feel sorry for ourselves. Maybe we go there and we find ourselves getting angry at what's happening around us. And maybe we go to these places we find a way of getting even. I don't know what we may do. David, I'm sure, had all kinds of thoughts running through his mind. But he found himself in a cave in a hiding place. Really not a good place for a king. Really not a good place for a man of God. But there he is. And he's in this hiding place and the reality is, here he is, he's in a cave. Notice his sorrow. He's at the bottom of life. I don't know about you, but that's not a place I really like to dwell. I don't know about you, but that's really not a place where I'd like to live, the bottom of life. I really don't feel like that that's within God's plan for us to stay at this place. Do you? Now, God may allow some things to come to teach us some very valuable lessons about ourselves and about others and about Him. He may do that. But it is not His intentions for us to remain in that place. He'll want to encourage you to move away from there. And so you may be in a place of sorrow this morning. Not a real, literal cave, but it's a place of sorrow. And there you find yourself at the bottom of life. And then you see His Son. Not only his sorrow, but his suffering. You know what he's found himself? Where he's found himself? There's no promise. No promise. Family is not here. There's no finances. And I really don't even know about the future. Have you ever heard somebody make the comment, you know, there's a light at the end of the tunnel. I finally see a light at the end of the tunnel. I'll see out there in the future now we can be out of debt. I see out there in the future that we can dig ourselves out of this hole. Many years, Charles Stanley, years ago, Charles Stanley brought a message. And in that message, he was talking about a very dark day in his life. One of the most difficult days that he'd ever faced. And he said from day to day, there was the discouragement, there was the sorrow and the disappointment at what he was in ministry preaching. And then he said he awoke one morning and he said this thought came to his mind. And when he said it, it just absolutely astounded me what he said. And I thought about it down through the years. Here's what he said. From this wreck I rise. My life is a, is a wreck. It's in shambles. It doesn't look like I'm going anywhere. But I don't believe God wants me to remain there. And from this wreck I rise. And that might be what you need to look at this morning. That might be what you need to hear this morning. 
God is in heaven. He's on His throne. He wants to send heaven to thee. And I refuse to stay here. And from this wreck I rise. And not only do you see sorrow and suffering, but you see separation. Here's one of the most difficult things, I think, and that's to feel alone. Even Jesus experienced being alone. I think there was something to be said for the Garden of Gethsemane and the aloneness of that place. And to the disciples, remember what He said to the disciples? Wouldn't you even wait with me? Wouldn't you even pray with me one hour? Here I have found myself at the most important part of my life. This is what I have come for. This is the hour that I have come for. And you have left me alone. You won't even wait for me an hour with one hour and pray with me one hour. And that was the human side of our Savior. And I think the thing that reminds me of the darkness of that hour is Jesus was reminded that there would be a time in the near future when He would even be separated from His Father. And He had never been separated from His Father. Now think for just a moment. In all eternity past, how do you measure eternity past? 20 billion years? 100 billion years? 500 billion years? There really is no time with God. He lives in the eternal presence, past, present, and future. But you think about that. And not one time had He ever been separated from His Father. But now, because he was taking the sin of the world upon himself, he would be separated from his Father. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? You say, nobody knows how alone I am? Oh, yes. He does. But I get some of the most miserable moments, some of the most awesome moments, terrible moments that come to us is when we feel alone. And nobody cares. You know, I believe that David probably had some of this coming to his mind. Where were all of those people? Where are all of those people that were singing my praises? Where were those people that were shouting on that day when I let loose of the sling? And Goliath fell. And then the soldiers all ran after the Philistines. Where are they now? All of the people that were so uh, near at those moments are so far away now and feeling alone. This is the reality of the cave. Sorrow and suffering and separation. I look back over my life and I'm sure that you do and I'm sure we can't say that when I found myself in my own personal cave and you found yourself in your own personal cave that you didn't learn something. That something very valuable came out of it. But I think you would say with me today, I'm not looking forward to the next one. Because they're not easy, are they? Let's go to the second thing and let's look at the revelation of the cave. Now we would go back and we're not going to take time to do it, but we would go back to Psalm 57. And see how God reveals some awesome truths to this young man. First of all, I want you to think about his call. And I like this. God's call was still upon him. When God calls, He doesn't remove that call, my dear friend. Now there might be a change of direction. There might be a change of ministry. But when God calls you, His call is still upon your life. I don't know about you, but I like to see a man just stay at it. I like to see a woman stay at it just year after year and year after year and year after year and year after year just stay at it until God calls him home. A few weeks ago we were driving to Chattanooga and in order to get to the BIM I, we, I always take a shortcut. I don't go down uh, 75 and, uh, and move over and come back up the main road because it's always so crowded during that time of the day going back into Harrison Bay State Park and back on Highway 58, and so I'll take a, a back road uh, in, in there. And every time when I come almost back into Harrison Bay, the thing that I see is Count Joy. 
And Camp Joy is a ministry of Highland Park, a ministry where Dr. Robertson founded. But every time I go through there, I always remember a Sunday afternoon when I was pastoring in, in Dayton. And we went down on a Sunday afternoon because Lester Roloff was going to be speaking. And Lester Roloff was one of my favorites. He's preached here. And all of the battles that Lester Roloff found himself in. You remember, you, you heard about it. You, I'm sure we this church was, was part of it. And then the day that God just took him home. You know what the Lord said? You've been faithful all of these years. You've been faithful to your calling. Now just come home. But a man that stayed with it year after year after year after year after year but because of the call of God upon his life. Not only do I see his call, but I also see his character. Look at verse 4. And he brought them before the king of Moab, and they dwelt with him all the while that David was in the hole. On top of all of the things that was going on in David's life, he had 400 of the most, if you will, motley crew. And he was responsible for them. <coughs> no, that's not the same thing. I see what you're thinking. Look back in verse 2. And everyone that was in distress, and everyone that was in debt, and everyone that was discontented gathered themselves unto him, and he became a captain over them, and there were with him about 400 men. How would you like to be the captain over that group and be responsible for them? But he did. And even in the midst of discontent and heartache, he stayed faithful to these men. And then notice his commitment. He knew where to go. He knew what to do. He knew he wasn't going to stay at this place. Then let's come to the last thing. Notice the refreshment of the cave. I think there was a point that David made up his mind, I'm not going to stay here. I'm at this place, but I don't belong here. I'm going to move on into the future and I'm going to serve God. By the way, every one of us have to make that commitment. No matter how unsure things may seem, no matter the fact that I can't see out into the future, I'm going to stay true and I'm going to move forward and I'm going to do something for the glory of God. What happens? God brings to him his family. You don't thank God for good things and good people. But brother, there's nothing like family. Let me tell you something, fella. If you've got a good wife that's standing behind you, you can make it. Amen. You can do it. You can continue on. As long as you've got a godly wife that says, I am for you, though everybody else may turn against you, you can make it. And thank God for that. If you've got a husband that loves God, though everything may be shaking around you, you can I know that there are families that are broken and I know there are families that are in turmoil. I understand that, but I'm talking about a godly family that sticks together, that stays together. Someone asked me at uh, lunch this week, we had made mention about going home to Tennessee, and someone said, uh, do you have anyone left? And I don't. My family's gone. All of my family's gone to be with the Lord. My wife has family there, but I don't have. But you know what? I have a family. I have a family. I have two sons and a daughter and grandchildren that I love and love me. And you know what? No matter how hard it gets, I've got my family. No matter how hard it gets, you've got your family. And if they're the kind of family that loves God, they'll stand with you. Not only to notice his family, but his followers. There were those that did love him, and there were those who were true friends. Now let's move up. Let's move out to the outer perimeters just a little bit. Thank God for friends. A man who would have friends must show himself friendly, right? But there is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. But thank God for friends. I want to say this morning that I'm glad that there are times that I pick up a phone call somebody. I want to say thank God that there are people that you can go to and talk to and you can trust them and, and they'll tell you the truth and they won't uh, wash things away. They won't wash it down. They'll tell you the truth, but they are your friends. And I'm sure these followers encouraged David. I thought about the matter of, of, of true friends. If a man is your true friend, he'll be willing to sacrifice for you. Hmm? Uh, you know, he, he may 
isolate himself a little bit by standing with you, but he's willing to do that. And he's willing to say, I'm here. I'll help you. I'll do anything that I can for you. And I'm sure this encouraged the heart of David. And so he said, thank God for these friends that are willing to sacrifice. And then they will be a loyal defense against your enemies. That's a great thing, isn't it? To be able to know that you have a friend and someone says something about you and they'll say, now stop right there. I don't want to hear anymore. I know he's not perfect. I know she's not perfect. That's my friend. Just don't say anymore. Don't go any, any further there. I'm going to stand for this one. I'm going to stand for my friend. And I hope we're all that kind of friends. Amen? A real friend will give you the freedom to be yourself. You don't have to put on airs. You can just be you. That's one good thing about home. You just be you. Amen? That's one thing about a good friend. Then a good friend is always encouraging. Always encouraging. David said, my family is here. My followers are here. And then I want you to notice his focus. I think from this point forward, his focus was getting out of the cave. And moving forward for the glory of God. Now, every single one of us must learn to deal with the difficult blows that we encounter. I don't know of a man or a woman of God that did anything for God in the Bible. But they had to come to a place where they learned how to deal with those difficult blows of life that come our way. Listen to me. A righteous man may get knocked down seven times, but he'll get up. And he'll keep on going, and he'll keep on moving, and he'll keep on serving God no matter what. I hope you're not in a cave this morning. But I'll guarantee you one thing. The hard blows of life are still going to come. We have to learn to deal with them. And we have to learn to move forward. Would you stand with heads bowed and eyes closed, please? You'll just stand quietly, solemnly, reverently where you are. In just a moment, Brother Woolwine is going to come and lead the choir in a song of invitation. Now they... So you're fixing, not hot, right? Not <laughs> the check picture, okay? All right. It's so good to have these friends with us coming to join, and I want you to welcome them today by the right hand fellowship of the church. And let's stand, please. And I want these dear friends to stand here at the front, come by, shake their hand, let them know how much you appreciate them, let them know you'll be praying for them. Brother Chuck, would you come to the platform and dismiss us in prayer? I also remember our prayer time tonight. Now at six thirty. Uh, 6 o'clock, I'm sorry. And the men in one place, the ladies in another. And be here for that. Then Brother Howard will be speaking, and then we'll have a reception uh, over the way. And I know that you will enjoy that. Now, you guys that want to play softball, some of you mentioned to me this morning. Meet with Curtis over here about where you are from there, Curtis. Okay? Uh, meet with him. Uh, I want you to know, Curtis, sign me up. I'm ready to go. I'll be back there shaking hands. But you've got your aches. Okay. All right, let's dismiss in prayer, Brother Chuck. Come and dismiss us and come around and shake hands with these friends. Okay. Father, we are so thankful that we can be here this morning. Thank you for this beautiful day. Lord, we thank you for a pastor who preaches from your holy word. Lord, I just pray that uh, what we've learned today, that we would apply it and that we would remember it, we would remind us of it. Lord, we do pray for these that are that were mentioned that were so sick. We think especially of uh, Tila and Brother Dale and others. Lord, we just ask that you minister to them in a very special way. Thank you for those that are here. Thank you for these that have joined this morning. We pray, Lord, that you would help us to be a blessing to them. And now, Lord, go with us as we leave this place and bring us back to